If you want to have victory over your circumstances, then change what you think about. Believe the report of the Lord, not the world system. Victory to overcome every circumstance is coming up next on Arkansas Live. Thanks for joining us every day this week. This edition is going to complete our a little mini-series on victory to overcome every circumstance. And as we said yesterday, you have to change what you think about if you're going to overcome every circumstances. First of all, you have to know what victory is. It's conquest. It's triumph over the circumstance. You have to guard against complacency. Don't get satisfied. Don't get complacent where you are. Innate, inborn, imparted into you from God is the desire to grow, to accomplish, to do. So you have to understand that's from God. That's not now, now, people have overdone it. They've gotten into ditch on either side of it, every road. They've, they've got into pride and ambition, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the natural uh, or supernatural impartation of God for you to excel, to succeed, to do. Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize. And you have to stay with it. You, we're going to deal with this today. You have to stand. When you've done all to stand, stand. Because... Every circumstance is circumstantial. It's temporary. It's subject to change. That's in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verses 16 through 18. Okay, let's go to Mark chapter 5 today. We talked about this woman yesterday, but let's read the scripture verse. Mark 5, beginning with verse 25. A certain woman had an issue of blood 12 years. Now, we're, we're still talking about not accepting the circumstances, victory to overcome them. She had an issue of blood, 12 years. She'd suffered many things, many physicians, spent all she had, but was no better, but rather, rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind him and touched his garment. Now, as I said yesterday, there was a press, a crowd. She pushed her way through the crowd to come to Jesus. For she said, so important, listen to this. For she said, and, and the Amplified Version says that she continually said, she continually said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be made whole. If I touch his clothes, I will be made whole. Now, she had a choice. She had suffered many things, and it said she grew worse. She could either have a grow worse image, or she could have an image of, if I touch his clothes, I'll be well. Now, this is, this is not mind over matter. This is not mental gymnastics. This is not metaphysical. This is, this is faith. This is the Word of God over the circumstance. And what I'm trying to get across to us this week is you can have victory over your circumstances, but you're going to have to have it do it God's way. You can conquer, conquest, triumph over every circumstance you're facing. And this is a good time to start at the beginning. So let's start today. So this woman said, I'm going to press through the crowd because I have been saying, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I will be whole. Now I don't mean to, I don't I don't mean to contradict or to contend. I'm not trying to be contentious, but I want to make something very clear. I've heard, and maybe you have too, that it was because Jesus was a rabbi and he supposedly wore the priestly garment, the tallit, and so forth. And there's no evidence here that he did. She may have, according to Jewish tradition, she may have, he may have had on a, a rabbinical robe, a tallit, whatever. And there is, I've, I've heard it said that, the, that this tallit, it, when she touched it, it, that's what healed her. There is no healing in a robe of any kind. 
It wasn't the robe that healed her. I've also heard it taught that when uh, Jesus went in to raise the little girl from the dead, that he took the tallit and laid it across her and it raised her from the dead. There's no evidence of that either, not in the scriptures. There, there, there is no priestly garment. There is no um, anointing oil. There is no um, anything that heals. It's Jesus that heals. Now, he may use and his anointing may flow through, but everywhere in the Bible where it talks about healing or deliverance or whatever, it's, it usually refers to the touch. And if you talk about oil, the, the word anoint means to rub on. So there's something about that touch. I'm, st I'm still meditating, doing a teaching on that. The touch, the hand. I was in a meeting with uh, a minister in Dallas, Texas, uh, by the name of Everett Fearbach. What a powerful man of God. I'm sure he's in heaven today because this was 40 years ago. And um, I've never seen quite the anointing on a man of God like it was on him. I, I had been in this conference. He had spoken at a minister's conference and, and we were in Tyler, Texas, I think, in a church and he, he began to lay hands on people. I never seen anything like it. In fact, there was such an anointing that he had to literally grab his coat and run out the side door to escape the, the crowd from wanting to touch him. Now, that's profound. I haven't seen anything like it since. <laughs> this was in the beginning of the, uh, the charismatic renewal, the early 70s and mid-70s. And, and he had, and I said all that to say this, he, he asked me, to come up and go along with him to pray with him for with the crowd. And I I mean he would take my hand, he would place his hand on my hand and pray for people and boom, the power of God would knock them over. And there was just a pile of bodies laid up there. They fell on top of one another. I mean, this was faster than any catchers. There weren't any catchers. And uh, he told me, he looked at me and he told me, he said, you have not been using your hands. Oh, he was so right and I was so repentant to God. And I failed in many times to use my hands to pray for people. But notice what he said. You've not used your hands. He didn't say you haven't prayed for people. He said, you haven't used your hands. And I realize there is something about the hand. It substantiates that in the Bible. And, and Jesus was moved with compassion toward the leper and touched him. This woman said, if I can but touch, touching goes both ways. People want to touch Jesus and Jesus was touching people. There's something about the touch. It wasn't to delete it wasn't the robe. It, 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 it's not the bar of soap. It's not the oil. It's not. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the anointing. And this woman, because because when when Jesus turned to her, and he said, "Who touched me? Who touched my clothes?" She was embarrassed, afraid. And the woman, fearing, trembled, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down at his feet and told him all the truth. And he said, daughter, your faith made you whole. Not the robe. I mean, I mean, you know, if it was the robe, the garment, whatever, we could preserve it and, you know, hang it on a hanger and let everybody come by and touch it. It wasn't, it wasn't that. It was the anointing. It says virtue went out of him in um, verse 30. It said, immediately anointing himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said. Everybody was touching him. That's what the disciples couldn't, couldn't get across. They, what, what does he mean, who touched me? Everybody's touching you, Master. Yeah, but somebody touched me and virtue, power, went out of me. Hmm. You remember in Philippians 2, we read yesterday where it said, think on these things. Uh, I'm sorry, Philippians 4, think on these things. 
things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. This woman touched Jesus with her faith. And he said, your faith is what made you whole. What you said, what you believed. Victory, victory over the circumstances means to not accept the undesirable circumstances. She could have accepted that and says, well, this is my lot in life. I'm one of these unlucky ones. Maybe this is God's will. And she would have had that issue of blood for the rest of her life till she died. It's important that you not accept undesirable circumstances. And again, I say for clarity, it's, it's, it's not denial. Faith does not deny what exists. There is no power in denying what exists. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says to call for what is not yet seen as though it were. What is not seen? Your healing, your health, your finances, your prosperity, your deliverance. So you call for what you don't have yet. That circumstance, that circumstance is temporary. It's subject to change. Financial lack is reversible. It is subject to change. You can change it. Your victory, your faith can change what is temporary, what is circumstantial. You know what circumstantial evidence is? <laughs> it's circumstantial. It fits the circumstance. Usually you hear that in murder investigations or uh, whatever trial is going on. It's circumstan circumstantial evidence. And a lot of times in court, they throw that out. It's circumstantial, which means it's subject to change or incorrect. Hey, there are, I don't know, probably hundreds, maybe thousands of inmates in prisons across this country and from the time they came up with DNA that have been released, found innocent. They were found guilty on circumstantial evidence Fits the, fits the circumstances, they had a record, they were in the right place, they had a motive, circumstantial evidence. But then the DNA testing comes along and proves that it was not them that committed the crime and they are released. Unfortunately, after serving 10, 20, 30 years, their lives have been wasted away for a crime they didn't commit. The evidence that put them there was circumstantial. Well, the evidence that, that Satan brings against you is circumstantial. It's subject to change. Here's your spiritual DNA. Here, here's, here's your inheritance. Are you with me? So this woman, she said, if I touch the hem of his garment, she continually said, Amplified Version says, and she touched his garment and she was made whole, and Jesus turned to her and said, Your faith has made you whole. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now let's close with Ephesians chapter 6. Let's go over to Ephesians 6, and let's read verse 10 through 17. Well, we won't close with this verse. We'll read you some more, but this is our closing point. Stand. When you've done all to stand, stand. What do I do, Pastor Caldwell? I stand. In Ephesians 6, 10, Finally, my brethren, the conclusion, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. A wile is a scheme, a plot, a plan. Satan endeavors to move you in a position where you look at the circumstantial evidence and you think, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. But the victory that overcometh says, I can overcome this situation. I don't deny its reality. I don't deny it exists. You, you get into mind over matter and metaphysics and you'll deny that the sickness even exists. It does exist. 
Faith doesn't deny what exists. Faith denies its right to exist. Faith overcomes it with the Word of God. So he says what to do. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the schemes, the plots, the plans of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. These are the four categories of Satan's kingdom. Uh, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual weakness in high places, principalities. Wherefore, I mean, he doesn't leave you there. He, he tells you, wherefore, when you come against these things or they come against you, here's what you do. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may, able to, may be able to withstand in the evil day. Now, folks, we're in the evil day today, if you haven't noticed that you can withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand. When you've done everything that you know to do, that you've been told to do by the Holy Spirit, what do you do? You stand. Is there anything else I need to do? No, nope. just stand on what you got. Stand on it. You, <laughs> you got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. Stand there. Stand there. Don't fold up. Don't give up. Don't quit. Just stand there. As John Osteen used to say, God, don't settle up every Saturday night. Stand. When you've done all to stand, what do I do? Stand. But I've been standing. What do I do? Stand. And you're going to see evidence. You're going to see results. You're going to see the tumor shrink. You're going to see the disease fade away. You're going to see the money come. You're going to see the lack disappear. You're going to see the oppression leave. When you've done all to stand, what do you do? You stand. When you've done all to stand, stand. And then it goes on and says, stand. Verse 14, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, where which you'll quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, make a distinction here. In verse um, 11, Ephesians 6, 11, it says, stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles are plot plans or schemes. They're not a frontal attack. Here in uh, verse uh, 16, it says, take the shield of faith, which will quench the fiery darts of the wicked. The darts are visible. They're, they're a frontal attack. And you take the shield of faith and you, it says here that you quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. A dart is a frontal attack. It's something that Satan's throwing at you. But a scheme is not a frontal attack. Satan is a coward. He comes around behind. He comes around and he works wiles and schemes, plots and plans. If you know anything about politicians, politics, I wish, they'd, I wish they'd come up with another word because just by definition, politician is not a good positive word. If I were a, a member of a body of politics or in the Senate, in, in any of the governing offices. I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like that word politician. A, politi a politician, the word politician, leaves you to believe that someone is um, studying or participating in a science of politicking, uh, which, and you've heard these terms, uh, you have to compromise, you give a little, take a little, you work. It's, it's, it is uh, a profession of compromise. You have to learn to bend. You have to learn to put up with. You have to learn to compromise. It, it's hard for people of principle to compromise. But in the political world, if you don't compromise, you don't get anything done. If you, if you just, you know, hold your ground, so to speak, you become everybody's enemy. Nobody likes you. Everybody's, you know, again you. <laughs> but... A scheme is a plot or a plan. If you've ever studied politics or uh, watched it any length of time, I'm talking about years, 
and, and you understand and you keep a record or you remember historical things, you'll see that politics is full, contaminated with schemes, plots, plans. It's, it's always been that way and it's going to continue to go on. I don't believe that God ever intended for America to be a nation of politics and politicians. I believe that God intended for us to serve our country in any capacity that, he was, that we were called to, to serve as statesmen, senators, representatives, uh, governors, mayors, city officials, police officers, you name it. Any, but I don't, I don't believe God called us to be politicians to work and connive with schemes and tactics and whatever. And if you've ever observed this, we see this today. I mean, this is going on. Political parties are scheming, conniving. Uh, they're leaking. They're, they're lying. They're, they're deceiving to accomplish a goal, an end result. And therefore, the American people have just been fed up with it. And because they, they're tired of all of this conniving and scheming and whatever, and they want, they want all the parties to work together for the good of America, for the good of the nation. And so they're looking for people that will just flat tell the truth. But the politicians don't want that because they have bought into this body of politics where the scheming, the lying, the deceiving, the schemes, that's a way of life now. It's, it, they have become it. It has become them. And so when somebody comes in, this just, you know, candid camera, what you see is what you get, and they're just totally honest. I don't mean they're above reproach. I mean, they just tell it like it is. Oh, we got to put a stop to this, man. We can't have this. It'll show us all up to be liars and schemers. And, and that's why they set about to destroy that person or that body or that bunch or that party, because they want to keep and maintain the, the schemes and the wiles. Well, that's the way the devil operates. And that's what the Bible says, stand against the wiles of the devil. That's strong language, but that's what it is. And he said, the shield of faith will quench the fiery darts of the wicked. It's, it's no problem to move the shield of faith around to stop the darts. Took, 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 took. But a scheme and a wile comes around behind you. And it, in, in, the, in the church world, in the spiritual world, he does it with false doctrine. He does it with half-truths. And he tells you, well, you know, God's trying to teach you something. That's why I gave you cancer. No, that's not right. That's a scheme. That's a while. You can overcome that with the truth. The knowledge of the truth makes you free from the schemes and the wiles and the, and the untruth and the dishonesty. So when you've done all to stand, what do you do? You stand. What are you standing on? The Word. I'm standing on my faith. And he goes on to say, um, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and application for the saints. And then, and then it, while you're standing, what are you supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be confessing the Word of God over the circumstances. Mark eleven twenty three. 23 of course, is the scripture that comes to mind because I heard Brother Hagin preach on it so many times. It says, Whosoever shall say to the mountain, to the circumstance, to the obstacle, to the problem, Whosoever shall say, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now notice, believe is only in that scripture verse one time. Say is in there three times. So saying it is really emphasized more than believing. You believe it once, but you say it three times. While you're standing, you're saying the word. Uh, in, in Revelation, it talks about overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. What is your testimony? My testimony is that I believe God. I believe the Word. And I am saying the end result. What you're saying may not fit the moment. The circumstances may be evidence of 
this is not the truth because you're, we're broke and you're saying we're prospering. We've given and it's given unto us. So what you're saying doesn't match up with what we're seeing. But what I'm saying will change what I'm seeing. It gives God something to work on. Again, it's not mind over matter. It's not just saying something a bunch of times. Go over to Daniel chapter 10. Listen to this. Your words from God, God's words, give something, God to, give something for God to work on. Look at Daniel chapter 10. You remember da Daniel um, thrown in the lion's den, blah, blah, blah. Verse 12, Daniel 10, 12. Then said he unto me, an angel, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day, first day, that you did set your heart to understand, to chasten yourself before God, your words were heard, and I am come for your words. Whew, man, that is so powerful. The angel said, I have been sent from God. I am come for your words. So what do you do when you're standing? You stand. What do you do while you're standing? You confess the word of God. Don't get complacent. Remember, don't accept the undesirable circumstances. Watch what you're saying. Watch what you're watching. Watch what you're thinking. Because it all has to do with what you're going to receive. Victory over the circumstances. The angel said, when you prayed the first day, I heard your words. God heard your words, and I am come for your words. God himself dispatched that angel. Biblical, Hebrews 1.14. Are they all not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who should be heirs of salvation? God heard your prayers. He heard your words. And the angel was dispatched the first day to bring you your victory. He said, I am come. For your words. Have victory over your circumstances. Every day, every week, every month, every year. I trust this message is ministered to you. VTN's on Facebook. Find us at VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection. You can follow me at Twitter, happy underscore Caldwell if you like. And this episode is available to watch online. Log on to VTNTV.com. Click on Watch On Demand. We're also available 24-7 via live stream anywhere in the world you can watch VTM. Take us with you wherever you go. I do. I take my iPhone, my iPad. I watch it in the hotel. I watch it wherever I am. Just click on VTNTV.com and click on live stream. Don't forget to join me next time. And remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and wherever you're watching. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at P.O. Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com.